Good evening, everybody. My name is Bob Brera. I serve the district as superintendent. Just came in this the summer, so very excited to be in the community. Um, as you guys know, you have a great community, a great school district, so privileged to uh, serve the district in this capacity. And I, I look forward to you know the summer or the spring and throughout the summer and the fall. Um, actually had an opportunity rather than talking finance and business and bricks and mortar with the community to actually talk about our teaching and learning environments and, and where we'll be headed or what our focus will be in the next few years to um, you know work to enhance and, 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 and build upon some of the successes of the district um, in the past and then actually take a look at some more future focused and innovative um, instructional delivery models that we can bring into the district that would uh, serve our, our children well and help prepare them for the future. Oh, sorry. Good advice. That is a big difference, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, let me start all over again. No, um, okay, so so tonight um, we just like to present uh, information regarding uh, the, the post bond that, that will be on the ballot in March and give you the information um, regarding that ballot proposal. But I, I, I would have to say, based on prior conversations with community members, um, this, this ballot um, proposal, um, often I get questions of, of regarding the, the prior bond and the district's progress on the prior bond. So I just want to let you know that we are um, going to begin to present information to the community on, on, on all, everything that went on in the bond, the things that occurred, how the money was spent, where, where we're at with the with the closure of that bond, um, and then and then so but it ends up being you know almost two different conversations. So if you would, if you have questions, um, Diane Bowman's here tonight, and she'll pass out comment cards. And if you if you if you ask ask a question regarding the last bond that I don't have the knowledge because I wasn't here to to answer or respond to, we would like to give you a thoughtful response to that because we are getting questions. So. We're, going to, we're preparing an FAQ for questions from the community regarding the last bond and decisions that were made and, and resource allocation from the last bond, and we'll get that back. But so your, your questions are valuable to us because um, we, we do we are receiving questions regarding that. So um, so Diane will pass those out and collect them at the at the end of the night for us. I'd also like to introduce John Reby. John's our director of facilities, um, so he's very he's a ton of knowledge of the history of of the progress of the district, and especially in the, in the area of bond and, and all the um, activities that took place over the last five years. We have Jennifer Kaminsky here tonight as well. She's, um, she serves as Assistant Superintendent for Finance, and um, she, she can probably handle, or would, would be best suited to talk to you about um, any questions related to bond sales, how the bonds are structured, what it, what it means to sell bonds, and, 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 and how that affects, um, how they determine the number of bills based on property values and, and, and those types of things. So I guess I'll, I'll just begin um, by uh, framing this conversation with Um, so when, when the board, so this is this is where the, the two bonds kind of be those two conversations. So with the 2015 bond, um, as the community knows, it was scaled back a couple times before the community approved that bond passage. And so when it was scaled back, the, the, the areas that were identified for improvement in the in the initial bond campaign, obviously all of those weren't able to be addressed. So that original study took place in 2009. So facility studies took place in 2009, and, and the, all the work was identified. I believe it was you know 200 plus million dollars in terms of the, the identified needs of the district at that point in time, or the proposed needs to the community. The district scaled that back after the bond failed, and, and then they scaled it back one more time after the second bond failed, and then the voters 
opportunities approved $131 million on. So the so when the district began to address concerns, basically they just prioritized areas that they believed um, were the highest need, and they began to address um, those needs within the infrastructure and the renovations to the buildings. So of course, not all those needs were addressed. So then the district in 1819, again, just prior to my arrival, um, conducted another facility study to determine the progress or, or the, the remaining items and their condition that, that weren't covered from the first bond. And, and that total, those identified needs, totaled $98 million. So the Board of Education, um, what the Board of Education usually does is they, they identify how many mills need to be levied um, to raise the $98 million. Um, our financial advisor is the Ms. Flo that, that in order to, to raise the $98 million, um, that is a 0.9 mills levy would, would raise the $98 million. So timeliness, this, this just happens to occur that when, this is something that if you need more details, Jennifer can probably come up there and, and, and explain to you. But basically, when you structure the last bond, it's like if we buy a house, structure over 20 years, and then we, then we get a payment plan. Well, in bonds, certain items that you spend the bond on are required to be paid back within the first six years. So your payment plan within the first six years is at a little bit higher rate. So you have to levy a higher number of mills those first five or six years to pay that rate back. And then you pay, you pay that principal and interest down, and then after about five or six years, you pay the bulk of that down, so now your, your payment plan reduces. So the community, so this, so you, you levy less mills to generate that revenue. Does that make sense so far? So we, we happen to be in a, a, a situation right now where with the way the 2015 bond was structured, that we, we paid those first five years down, and so the bond, the, the mills levied to, to pay that bond back will drop one mill for the community next year. So the proposal is um, with the $98 million, okay, if the community would re just renew or continue to support 0.9 mills of that one mill decrease, um, then that would cover the, the, the $98 million. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so as you see some of these slides, um, we, we, can, we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. So this, this kind of is a graphic rep representation. So right now the current debt millage is 3.3. If the bond passes, okay, the debt millage rate will drop to 3.2 still. Okay, that, that tenth of a mill um, adds up to about $12 million for the community in terms of savings. Then just to clarify this, if the bond does not pass, that, that millage rate will drop to 2.3 mills. Does that make sense? Could you repeat that again? Yes. So if the bond were to pass, the debt, the debt mill millage rate would still decrease to 3.2 mills. Mm -hmm. From 3.3 to 3.2. If the bond were not to pass, then the debt millage rate would drop to 2.3 mills. Also significantly less. Yes. So right now the current millage rate is 3.3. And next June, one way or the other, it'll be 3.2 or 2.3. Right. Yes. Could you kind of explain how much of the, the 2015 bond is now paid will be paid off next year? In other words, what will we totally owe the banks or whoever? That would be a question for Jennifer now. So that's okay. Nope. I'm just confused as to how this is. Okay, that's fine. You're asking for the total amount left yes. right. that we have to pay? Okay. Yeah, you can find you know, approximately, the not Right. So while Jennifer's looking that up, I, is there more questions? Certainly. Looking at the facts, though, school supplemental, 
currently 3.78 school taxes in the, in, the, in the community and in the county. Um, so I'm gonna, this is a perfect time for me to turn this over because <laughs> it'll just get more confusing the longer I hold on to this. <laughs> so the supplemental millage that you see on your tax bills uh, is operating millage that we are allowed to levy and we do go out to the taxpayers periodically to have that renewed. So if you recall, back in 1994, Proposal A was approved um, by voters. And districts who were already spending and receiving tax dollars at a certain rate um, were given, I guess, the ability to, um, to, to go out to taxpayers and ask for additional knowledge. Um, so the community was supporting us at a greater rate than the state was actually going to pay us through Proposal A. So the amount that we can levy additionally, um, as long as we have authorization from the voters, is $2,067 per people. And that amount has stayed the same since 1994. So uh, the millage rate fluctuates based upon um, taxable values. Um, so it, it did rise several years ago. Um, as taxable values dropped significantly. So um, it started to come down again um, as we've lost students as well. So we levy or we collect uh, less dollars for that knowledge. So, um, and the debt knowledge is a completely separate um, knowledge from that operating knowledge. Um, and, and that's what this discussion is about. Yeah, so, so operational costs mm -hmm. are what? What, what, are, what do we consider operational costs for the school? Operational costs are, are salaries, um, benefits, utilities, anything to, to keep our schools running um, on a daily basis. So, but the majority of our costs are um, for wages and benefits to education. So, so when we talk about how bond dollars can be spent, can bond dollars be used to support operational costs? Bond dollars cannot be used um, for operational costs at all. So we're required um, by law to keep those funds in a separate account, in a separate fund. Um, and each year, we um, have had an audit on our bond funds. So when the auditors come out to do our annual audit, they also audit this um, as well. And then at the end, as we kind of reach the, the end point, they come out and do kind of a, a final review on bond um, and issue a report to us. Yes. So, so you still didn't answer the question. How much of the 2015 bond? How much is paid off? And then I know I was trying to find the schedule in here. So you you could be approximate. You know, I, oh, you can your bonds. Yeah, I just I because I, I, I don't understand the three. It's over hundred million. I'll give you a minute to go look that one up. Oh, here it is. So, um, principal is about 116 million remaining. So then, if we're going to take 116 and we're going to add 98,000 to 98 million to it, correct? And somehow or other, we're going to get a decrease in the rate or the decrease in the amount of money we're putting out as a as, That's a, as a homeowner. I don't That's get it. I don't understand. Well, and um, as Dr. Herrera mentioned. The bonds are set up with a, a certain payment schedule um, at the beginning. And so our principal and interest payments were higher the first six years to pay off those type of items like technology and buses that have a shorter useful life. Um, and then the payments start to go down. Since we have um, kind of a spend schedule, we're going to be spending more right, money on sure. technology. They will go up a little bit further down the road, but as our taxable values rise, um, 
the millage decreases just naturally. Um, so again, again, just to be, I hate to be a kid, but yep. <laughs> the, the original fine in 2015 was, my memory's right, about 131 million. That's correct. If I understood you correctly, mm -hmm. it's now, there's 116 million left to pay on, right? Correct. And now we're gonna add on top of that 98 million, and somehow I as a taxpayer am gonna be paying less money, something doesn't, it doesn't add up. And it's all based on how the payment schedule is structured. And our financial advisor has put together that information, you know, for us based on issuing the two series again. So we issue, I think, approximately $68 million in the first um, series, and then uh, the, the remaining 30 in the second series. And again, the, the, the payment schedule is set up um, a certain way to pay off those items that we need to pay off at a quicker pace. Um, and, and, and they have an estimated millage rate that's calculated for, for all of those years. So. Yeah, so, so there's, so there's, there's many factors, variables that impact the, the mills that need to be left between um, taxable values and, and the market and the interest rates. But, but in general, maybe if I hopefully respond to your question, Information you're seeking. Um, it, I understand conceptually you're saying if we had $98 million of this, how do we pay less? Uh, <laughs> and in this particular case, um, we, we have about 15 years left to pay that $116 million, right? And then this new, the $98 million would be structured over another 20 years. So you're really extending your payment plan out five more years to cover the total amount now of that. So I think from, from a borrower's point of view, we know that if we we, we spread the pain, we spread the, the years in terms of the, the loan out, then, then the, the rate will go down. But, but we're still sticking to the same payment plan, the 20 year payment plan from that bond. So there's still only 15 years to pay on that. Um, but we'll begin to pay off the 98 million during that 15 years as well. So that there'll be five years additional to pay on that. Does, does that help? Does, yeah. Sure. But do you say, I think the other number you said is if we don't pass the bond, it drops to two point right. So and, and then it ends in 15 years. Yeah, that be, I think for, um, for the one series. Right, for the first series. For the first series. For the second series, it's 18 years. So that was my question. I wanted to follow up. Based on, I don't know what you're using as the average or the median cost of a home in, in, in Farmington Public Schools community, mm -hmm. What? how will that actually impact? What will so the dollar we, 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 we have that. But you know, I was going to say, if you could kindly compare the 3.2 with, what did you say, 2.3, but multiply times the payoff of the original versus the, you know, the new extension as well. So all the dollars and cents built in. And so, there's a slide. Yeah, there's a slide for that. So we'll, we'll, we'll actually have a problem. Okay, so, so that really, like I said, when you, when you start talking about bonds and the way they're structured and how property values and, and how the market impacts all that, um, there, there is a lot. You could probably just have, you know, we could spend an hour and a half just talking about, about that aspect of it. We could bring our financial advisor in to, to talk to you about how they, they really do that. Um, but we, we, uh, we, we do have to deal with that. So, so it, as I mentioned earlier, um, as we're getting into this conversation, why now? Um, well, we, we remember those, uh, those um, infrastructure issues we identified back in 2009, um, and we didn't address what the last bonds still exist. And as a matter of fact, they're 10, year old, 10 years older with this study, so, so they're even aging more. Um, we, we, for example, we just had a boiler brought at East uh, Middle School a couple weeks ago, and um, so we're, we're going to need to begin to work to keep up on, on replacing those as they, they meet their useful life. Um, the buses are, we have about 95 buses in our bus fleet. And it's, so the buses are, uh, we, we're, we're behind on our um, um, scheduled recycling of the buses. So the last bond purchased 30 buses. Um, but out of, the, out of the 90 that we need to, to keep the, the kids the fleet up and running. Um, but, but so right now, uh, we have about 30 buses that are 10 plus years. Um, so they've, they've already reached their life expectancy. So this would allow us to catch up on that bus replacement cycle as well. It would actually put us, you know, to date, by the end of the next five or six years, we would be current with those. 
Um, the, the technology, um, we, that, that's part of one of those teaching and learning conversations, but you know that technology infrastructure is extremely important um, so that students have the ability to use devices in the classroom and teachers have the uh, ability to use devices in the classroom as a means of learning. And that, as we all know, technology is a never ending game to try to keep up with and, and, and stay current. Last but not least, um, we, uh, with that technology piece, I guess I should say some of it is embedded in surveillance as well. Um, we tried to improve all of our safety and security areas. Um, the elementary didn't get complete with the last bond, so we might like to make sure that they have um, their surveillance um, in, in, in the buildings. Now surveillance, I have to admit, surveillance looks a little bit different in elementary than it does in high school because you're not usually worried about hallway behavior and things like that. But we really do, we really are concerned about the exits and entrances with people coming into the building and, and little ones wandering off. So the, 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 the safety and security practices for school as well, those best practices, have really um, up the cost for us in terms of infrastructure. You know, we have, we're required to have safe and secure entrances now. Um, we have buzzer systems to allow people in on the last time you've been in the buildings. Um, but, but the buildings are all secure. All the locks have to be, you know, improved and up to date. And, and all the, um, and like I said, all the surveillance cameras. So, both, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, before we got to this stage in, in, in our safe and secure environments for students, um, there, there wasn't a cost associated with that. But now, um, we, we face a lot of costs associated with safety and security. Um, I have a question on this slide. Yes. Um, and I for this bond, but just so for my own interest, um, you know, the surveillance, and I'm dealing with three children in an elementary school. I'm curious, and I support that. It's great. Let's do it. How does that compare to neighboring communities? Like, would we be the first to do that kind of thing in the elementary level, or are we kind of about hockey? We're, we're a little bit behind in that area. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, I think we, 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 we we began to catch up with our entrances with the last bond, but certainly in our elementary buildings, um, some of these areas that we, we worry about with, with folks coming in that aren't using the, the proper entrance and the proper protocols to come in. And, and of course, our biggest worry is, is, is you know, an adult wandering one of the students out the back doors, then that's not official. So, so with the safety and security, again, you know, from a parent's perspective on that, you, you really can't overdo the safety and security pieces in school anymore. Yes? So I know this predates your time uh, with the district. However, when we last as a community attended these forums for the bond proposal, these were two big issues, security and technology. Yep. And security was supposed to have been a priority then. And they told us that they would update and address all the security deficiencies at that point. That was like the number one priority. And secondly, because I remember the speech when acting about the obsolescence of technologies, and we were told at the time that this contemplates all the, you know, what would be down the road, and that this would put us in good shape to be competitive te with technology. Okay. So I'm a little bit chagrined to learn about this. Okay. Um, the, you know, I don't, and again, with the, I think I think that is that. Somebody note that comment. And that's what I said. I think I can find that information out. Okay. Back to you. you. Can give me your contact information. Well, it's everybody in the community. I'm sure would want to. Right. So, and, and we'll put in an FAQ, and we're, right. we're going to get those out there regarding the progress and decisions that were made in the last month. Actually, I, I did. We we've already begun to collect information. I met with um, the, the staff today, and they're they're putting some information together regarding the last bond. And, and how decisions were made that reallocated money or areas that were scaled back. So I think that's I, that would be my response at this point in time is is you know I don't know when that was communicated to you on which bond and I can't tell you when when they got into the bond if there were other costs associated or, or other priorities came up and how they scaled that back. But the only thing I can tell you right now is is <coughs> I can tell you how many how many cameras were short in our elementary buildings to accomplish what I just told you. Um, so so I can, we can identify our current needs and I feel very confident about what our current needs are. Um, then it's, it's going to be this, this uh, what we'll do this next time around to assure you that that work's actually completed. Because that's, that seems to be the question I get was, uh, we were told this and then this occurred. So I, I hear you loud and clear on that. Uh, especially, I, I mean, to me, as a, as a, as a, as a you know, 
children attended schools here, now they're out of the schools, but security, we have to, that's, that's first and foremost, that's the paramount concern, and we were assured, last bound, we last came, not Cuba, because the district sure. last came close, that that would be a numero uno priority. So let me, let me just share this with you then. Since my arrival in the district, um, we, we have revised our emergency operation plans, so we have all new, um, no public set of rules, we developed it, our protocols, we developed that with uh, the emergency responders and the, and the two police chiefs in both Farmington Hills and, and the city of Farmington. So that's been a joint effort with, with the law enforcement and emergency responders and us. Um, that book looks about this big, or at least for the entire district, all the way from evacuations to reunifications to what to do in a, in a, a, a life threatening event to what to do if there's a chemical spill or our hazardous weather condition. So we, we, act, we have the emergency response, emergency operation plan for the district. Then from that, we develop emergency management guidance. So those are currently in progress to be developed. Um, so each building has their own emergency management plan that details everything you do in every event. But remember, that also calls for additional security measures too in terms of you know enhancements to security and locks and, and certain things like that. Finally, uh, and that to complete that, we haven't got these completed yet, but the teachers will all get updated classroom response guides so they'll have that nice little flip chart. When any incident occurs, they can flip to it, they know immediately what to do. Now, the, the thing is, is all those protocols from one, from even 10 years ago have all changed in terms of best practices. So those are things we need to catch up on. So all I'm saying is, is when we talk about certain technologies, um, they're embedded in other processes and protocols that kind of drive the need for the technology, especially, especially when it comes to security. But just so that you understand me, you know, we're only talking four years ago, the 2015 uh, bomb, and again, at the time, we were told that this money could be used to address whatever deficiencies there were, and in answer to this other mother, when you're telling me that we're behind other areas, it's very distressing. Right. And, and, I, and again, I, like I said, that's when we started this meeting off, you know, I acknowledge that there, there have been concerns expressed from the last bomb, but the, the problem with, I guess, the communication of this is, is if I spend all my time in here on the last bomb and all the concerns and I try to address those in probably not a very effective way, um, I, I don't have a chance to communicate what's going on the ballot, so I missed an opportunity to make sure the community is informed of what we're currently um, as a, is on the ballot. So I certainly respectful if you have concerns about the last bond, but I really need to stay focused on what this bond is intended for. The, excuse me, the last bond is an integral part of what you're asking for. Because you asked us for 132, not you, the district asked us for $132 million and there, what has was done with the last bond impacts greatly for why you're asking for this bond too. So right. I don't believe you can separate the two. Well, I'm gonna do my best to try. <laughs> so, <laughs> so again, if you have these concerns, um, you know, I would, I'm gonna, we're gonna take your questions and we will get back to you and we'll add them to the FAQ. And like I said, I certainly acknowledge that these concerns exist in the community and, I, and I, we want to give you, the, you know, I wanna give you an accurate and thoughtful response. I wasn't here, so I'm gonna have to do some fact finding on those. I really appreciate it. And, and so we will, we will we'll do that to the best of our ability. Um, it's, but, but, you know, we've kind of got to keep moving through this one first. And then, and then af afterwards, you know, we can do a QA and a and then you can bring all these concerns up as well. And maybe that would be a better way to manage it. So just in general, and I guess to summarize this, the bond covers the following, um, mostly infrastructure equipment pieces, safety and security buses, tech integration, and the outdoor site improvements. So here's the slide we talked about, or we were, we were mentioning that you brought up. So the environment for deals, I like to use the 200,000 just because they're clean numbers. Um, so if you take a look at the 200,000, if your property is valued at $200,000, then your SCV or, or what your taxable value is about $100,000. Uh, if, this, if this bond passes, right, you'll still note that that projected mill decrease. So you, you would you'd have a decrease in your yearly payment of $10. Okay, if this passes. So, so you, would, you're, you're, you would continue to support the district at the $90 a year, which is $7.50 a month. So that was what, that's what this bond proposal would cost 
Now remember, that's not additional cost. You're already paying that, so it's just continue to pay the same amount. And, but in, in July, you know, like I said, if this dropped the full mill, right, you would you would not be paying that hundred dollars a month. You would your, your taxes would drop up not a month, hundred dollars a year if you own a two hundred thousand dollar home. Does that make sense? Okay. So the cost you write down is the two hundred thousand dollar home. You would you would you would actually pay ten dollars a year less than you're currently paying. Okay. This is this is where I have a hard time as an educator. Um, not venting. So if I, if I start to go on and on, you tell me to hold up and we can talk about this afterwards, okay? So one of the things as an educator we're concerned about, and I know everybody's heard about this, is the way schools are funded in public education. So let me just explain conceptually what happens. Let's say that, we'll make it easy, let's say we get $10,000 per student as a foundational allowance. Well, let's say we lose 30 students in the district. That's $300,000. So if you're, even from a business model, you know, how do you, you would have to make reductions to right size of $300,000, we know that. Well, the problem is, is when we lose 30 students, we lose one at the first grade, we lose two at the fourth grade, we lose one at the fifth grade, two at the sixth, three. So there's no way to right size. You can't reduce the teacher, you can't cut buses, you can't, you can't cut the principal, you can't cut staff. So you have to look for other cost efficiencies because we're only getting operational money from the state. So if you read the Michigan Research Council's literature, um, they, they've been pressing the state that compared to other, other states, we are, we are very underfunded in terms of operational costs that we get from um, our state. So, and, and I know what that means to taxes and everything, I'm just saying based on funding formulas. So let's, let's say we, we make it easy on ourselves, and let's say we lose 30 students at the second grade. Well, that's $300,000, like cut a section of second graders does that one teacher still, does a teacher make $300,000? No, so I'm still looking for other ways to make reductions. So it's very, very difficult to right size in schools because of the way our funding structure goes. Now let's reverse that. Let's say I'm a school district that gains 30 students. I get $300,000 extra, and did I have to add any cost, operational cost? No. So, so that's, that's the complaint against the state. If you're a district that's in declining enrollment, there's literally no way to win that game without making radical changes to your district. Closing buildings, outsourcing personnel, you know, and all that, it, you know, for a community, that, that affects, you know, the, the overall community, what you're going through, and, and all that right sizing. I don't get me wrong, if you, if you want to be efficient, you want to be a good steward of the district's money and allocate as much to the, the classrooms as you can. But, but it's, it's just a really tough funding structure to survive in. So, so on top of that, though, you can see that we only receive operational costs from the state. And remember, how do we address these infrastructure costs? So, so this is, is just to show you, or, or in my mind, to depict that every school district in the state, certainly in this county, is it has to, in order to financially stabilize their district, has to seek alternative revenues from the community to maintain their infrastructures. But, but, this, but this should note for Farmington Public Schools over here is that you're not required to levy very many mills because you've got such a strong tax base. So if you compare this, you know, we're only levying about 3.5 mills or 3.6 total altogether. And if you go to Ferndale, they're at, they're at six and a, almost seven. And then they had a sinking point on top of that. So, so from an educator point of view, we're all in this game. We all have to go to the community because we only receive operational costs from the state. We have concerns about that way, that's funding the structure. And, and we have to go to the community to help with our infrastructure costs. So it's just a game educators have to play and these are conversations we have to have with our community. What's a sinking fund? A, a sinking fund is, is another structure to, um, to for the community to support, it's all tax-based again, but it's structured, I believe, and Jennifer can explain this, in terms of structure over 10 years, are sinking funds? Yes, I think that's the maximum. Now. Yeah, sinking funds are a maximum of 10 years, um, and they have limited use to what you can spend the money on. So, in our, and they, they, they have a tendency to generate less revenues because you, they're structured differently. So for us, the sinking fund, I believe, would, what, what would our sinking fund raise total over a 10-year period? 55 million. 55 million, but in our case, 
it, 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 we can't spend it on buses and we can't spend it on certain technologies, so it really limits our ability to address some of our higher needs. So, so that is just, it's just not an appropriate structure for us to consider at this point in time. Doesn't the sinking funds cover some of the maintenance? And I mean, it's like a depreciation. Yeah, I mean, you can replace, yeah, it, it really helps in the maintenance area. You can, you can replace boilers and chillers and those types of things with it. Absolutely. You can't spend it on routine maintenance costs. But that would, yeah. It has to be a replacement. Of so it's like depreciation, right? Boiler depreciates, you can replace it. Correct. You, you could, yeah, but you yeah. can't use it to fix it. I guess that's what we're mm -hmm. just saying. So from the from a community perspective, um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, what good schools uh, mean to a community. And, and, uh, and so we, we know that good schools are, you know, they attract families, they attract business, industry, uh, they keep the property values high. I, I don't know anybody that disagrees with that. Um, it, it, the, the last one, so that's what leads me to this conversation on the third bullet point. So <coughs> speaking to the board in my first, you know, six months in the district and actually probably I go back and think about it, 70% of my interview questions were how we're going to improve the quality of our teaching and learning environment. So, so that's why I think from my end, it's very unfortunate that we're having conversations about bricks and mortar before we have a conversation about teaching and learning. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to, to, to getting these conversations over with the community and engaging um, it, it, with the community on, on, on things that, uh, the reason I got into education because uh, to improve those those you know opportunities for our teachers and our students to to have true quality learning environments, but but this but this so this bond and, and from from my end of this and this I guess I don't know if it's a unique perspective but if you think about what this means so if the bond doesn't pass okay for me then all of a sudden we know we have these identified infrastructure needs and I know that that over the next three to five years there are certain things we're going to have to replace with with a high, high, high likelihood. Um, so in order to replace those, I've got to take operational funds to pay for those. Those operational funds, remember, are programming and services for kids. So remember when Jennifer talked, we defined what operational costs were. That's our funding from the state, and that goes to pay staff salaries, it goes for programming, it goes for transportation, it goes for the lights and the heat and all those types of things. So if, if I have to replace a boiler now, <laughs> because we haven't replaced it through the bond funds, I have to pull that out of operational cost. So, so if, we, if, I, if I purchase a bus, $80,000, I have to pull $80,000 out of our programming. So, so when, I, when I take a look at the board, I'm like, okay, as we talk about the strategic plan, <laughs> our approach and, and, and the amount of work we begin to do over the next three to five years is, is gonna be somewhat influenced by our revenues that we have that I can keep in the classroom to get that work done. So what this slide just basically says is this, the bond helps us preserve keeping the money in the classrooms to develop, to maintain our programs and improve those programs. Again, from a better self-serving piece of um, mind on mind in order to really continue to move the district forward, um, as I'm pulling resources out of the classroom towards infrastructure, it makes it very, very difficult to make the gains and progress that I would hope to. So, so again, um, from a bigger picture, what this means to the district is simply, um, you know, what what revenues we have to address certain needs, or what what revenues that we have to utilize to address those needs in the future, and what that means going into the district. And I'm saying that the operational funds can be transferred over to the tech side, but not vice versa. Correct. So, so the bond funds can only, cannot be used operationally, right? But what I would be required to do is, is take operational funds and, and, and then begin to buy buses and replace boilers and, and the chillers and the system controls and purchase the security. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a little more difficult to make sure we're talking about apples and apples and mm -hmm. apples and oranges. Yeah, the, and maybe I just spoke on it or didn't speak clearly enough. So my only, the only point I wanted to make on this is, is that we, we, we have a 
typically when you look at charts like this, school districts that, that levy less mills typically have higher property values, more business and industry because one mill generates a lot more money. So for example, when I was on the west side of the state, um, if, I, if I levied one mill in South Haven, it would generate $28 million. If Saugatuck would levy one mill on the lakeshore, they would generate $55 million, okay, just because their tax base was higher. So that's just to point that out to you. The other thing I wanted to point out to you is there, you, you, good luck finding the K-12 public that doesn't have to have this conversation with the community and seek some type of campaign and levy mills. I wasn't really trying to compare our district to that district, just using it as a reference to all schools face this challenge and to rationalize why some school districts levy less mills than others. I've got a follow up for the Okay. Yep. So this particular slide, um, and, and I think it's, oh, I'm sorry. I should probably bring you up in the front row. Um, <laughs> this particular slide um, is, was intended, and, I, and I, I hope I don't have to go through it because I'll, it'll be another struggle for me. Um, but basically, you know, the ballot language is written in, in a lot of legalese. So I, I, can, I read it and it clearly makes no sense. It, it, it's intended to outline what the funds can be allocated for and the maximum amount we can collect from the district or from the community in taxes. Um, so, so basically that's the, the purpose of it. So if you look at the, at the middle part, it's bond receipts, they only be used for these purposes. If you look at the top, it says that's the maximum we can ask the community for. Okay, so for example, if your property values were to suddenly take a real big increase, okay, we, we wouldn't even be able to levy the 0.9. We'd have to levy 0.8 or 0.7 because we can't raise more generate more revenues than the 98 million. Does that make sense? Okay, so then the the, the next slide here kind of talks about um, the last portion of this. Now, that's where Jennifer's gonna have to come in because they give you a range of what that could, remember there's, there's those, um, and Jennifer just come on up. <laughs> so when you read this, uh, that, that first section in blue, I think it's blue. Um, so the section in blue talks about it will cost an estimated 0.9 mills, so we would have to levy uh, 0.9 mills in the first year to pay for this new bond. Um, and then it gives an, an average annual millage rate. So um, as we talked about, the principal and interest payments fluctuate in that payment schedule over time. We would need to levy less mills for um, the 15 and 18 issues, um, and so this bond may cost more at some point, uh, but the total overall millage rate would not exceed 3.2 um, over the life. So it is projected, I think, at some point, maybe seven, eight years down, down the road to start declining um, if we were to have these three issues. So. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then it talks about as well that we're going to issue the bonds in two series, um, as I mentioned previously, and that we cannot use bond proceeds for cap uh, operating costs. Um, that they um, will be spent on capital needs identified in this bond, and they are audited each year. Yes? The bonds may be issued at the same time with the same interest rates. The two of the two you said in two series. I'm sorry. Are the you said the bond this this current bond if passed will be issued in two series. That's correct. At the same time will they be issued and at the same interest rate? No. Uh, the first approximately sixty eight million would be issued um, in May or June this year, and then the second series would be issued three years later in 2023 around the same time. So, so the interest rates, are we making an assumption here about interest rates? Yes, there are assumptions that are made and honestly they're, they're done conservatively um, by our financial advisor so that we um, are putting out the most conservative numbers of what our millage rate might be along the way. One of, one of the things I think it's important to remember on the purpose of the two sales of the bond. So for example, if, if you're going to if you're going to borrow $98 million, you know the interest rate on that's going to be significant. 
So if you don't have to borrow all the $98 million, then pay, start paying on the interest rate immediately. Don't do it. Wait, wait until you until you really need the next sale of the series so you're not paying all that interest. So so we really save a lot of money in interest by, by doing the two sales, if that makes sense. And, and when we go out to sell the bonds, um, so for the last two issues, we did competitive sales, which means banks or whoever would like to purchase those bonds give us their interest rates for that 20-year period. So they're held to those amounts. So if interest rates fluctuate or change dramatically, um, you know, we're not affected by that. We're still paying whatever was quoted to us, you know, at the time of sale. I want to make sure I understand the person who up there. So, mm -hmm. the <coughs> to meet the requirements of the bond, new bond in just 2020, mm -hmm. the millage has to be 0.9. To pay off the bond, all 98 million over the life of it, and for the two issues, that loan is going to average 1.12 mills. That's that what that says. Yes. Can, when was when was the um, the previous bond prior to 2015? When was that paid off, and how long was that bond for? Uh, the you know? 2004 yeah. after our facilities. Um, I believe we did a few refunding issues along the way, so there was a question about. Um, why aren't we looking at refinancing the bonds or there's no talk about that. So you can only refinance the callable portion of bonds and that usually happens down the road, usually after about 15 years. So the last five or six years um, can be you know, refinanced. So we did do um, a refinancing in 2013 um, and then um, we also did one as part of um, the 2015 issue, so we refinance some other. So then we're still paying on, uh, are you saying we're still paying on the 2004? No, no. Those, everything's off. completely paid off. All previous bonds, all, all previous bonds, bonds have been paid. Are paid off. That's correct. We, we only have the 2015 issue and the 2018 issue that we're paying on. Can you clarify what, so the 2015 was also done in two series? That's correct, yes. 2015 and then 2018. And what were those two on the plans? I'm trying to think. I think it was 90 and 40. Yes, and we, we did receive um, premium on our bonds, so that it actually was additional funds for us. So when, when we talk about this 98 million, that's the principal that we can go out and sell. So if our bonds sell at a premium and we receive, you know, above that amount, that's additional funds for us to use towards our project. So um, I think the first issue may have been about 70 um, million, maybe higher, maybe closer to 80, and then the last one um, we received about 54 million. It's just the paper, I think, the point is correctly. Ninety-one million due on two thousand fifteen, and seventy-three million due on two thousand eighteen. And that probably includes interest as well. So when I did provide the information, I uh, I split it between principal and interest, but said this is really the total amount that we'll pay um, for that. So that's probably what that is. If you're showing an average rate over the life of the bonds of one point twelve. Mm -hmm. At what point do you ex do you forecast us seeing an increase on our taxes and that millage? You will not see an increase. Um, the millage is projected right now based on the numbers that were run um, to be 3.2 for maybe the next six or seven years, and then it starts to decline <coughs> slightly. Well, Again, no, I'm just talking about this, not taking into account the previous bond millage falling out. Okay. When what? does it go up for this? I don't know that offhand. Um, I can look. So I just know the first year we would need 0.9 mils. Um, right. So, you know, next year, you know, if you're asking for 0.9 now, mm -hmm. next year we're going to get hit with 1.5. Um, you know. If it were to increase for this bond, 
the other bond payments, the, the millage needed to pay those principal and interest payments would go down. So that's how the millage is um, you know, able to stay consistent for the next six or seven years. Next, I have, um, for those interested, I do have a big schedule that kind of shows that information. Um, that it may, it may be helpful to, uh, to see it, so we want to uh, talk with you afterwards. Any other questions? Yes. I just want to make sure I have the concept right and maybe help clarify for everybody else. So as it stands right now, what we are currently paying for the previous bond is anticipated to drop because of going from the 3.3 to the 2.3. That's correct. So we would see a relief in our taxes due to that. If you don't pass it. No, no, no. If, yeah, if we don't pass it. It's status quo, even if they weren't asking for it. That's what would happen. Correct. That we would see a relief. Because the schools need this money, we're asking for the, the new bond. And because we need the new bond, the offset is being negated but not completely. Correct. So that's how you're seeing a decrease. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that I had that correct. Yes. If the bond didn't pass, um, it would drop about a mil. Um, if it does pass, it drops a tenth of a mil. So just the last. Okay. So that's where that 0.9 difference correct. was. Okay. Yes. That's what I wasn't able to follow. Okay. So. Any other questions? Oh, that's it. I think that's it. Okay, one more question. Is it a financial question? I didn't know if we were at the end or not. But, yes, we will be, if you have any more financial questions while Jennifer's up here, we let her escape. <laughs> and you're, then you're stuck with me. Okay, go ahead. I'm trying to get a handle on philosophy and the long term. I understand the short term value is five years out or so. Well, actually, I believe it's 10 years out. We, we believe this will cover all of our infrastructure needs for the next 10 years. And, and, it, and it could be more. I would have to, you know, see them with the longevity of that. With the, it would get everything replaced. The, when the board identified this, we identified um, everything that we would know need to, need to be replaced in eight years. But and then if you take a look, consider what the prior bond accomplished, then we'd have completed everything in the district. <laughs> So, you know, it, it could be even farther out before we'd have to come back to the community because usually a, a bigger license. Well, and I kind of implies that there's an idea <coughs> what I'm trying to understand. And yeah, you know, is, is there ever a point, like what's the philosophy of the school district? Are you always looking to maintain a three point something rate? Is there ever a point down the road where you say, okay, we've got the bulk of the tech and the uh, and the buses and everything, so we're rolling smooth on so that the millage goes down at some point and we're good until we need something. That, that's actually a very good question. So so um, I'm gonna do my best to give you a, an answer that just gets to it without And by the way, thank you for this. I appreciate it. Oh okay. well not a problem. Um, I don't certainly deserve it in terms of our request. Um, so, so let me try to answer it this way: When, when you develop the district's budget, okay, we have to develop a, a balanced budget each year, and we have we do have areas that um, we we have capital project money, right? and we, those are kind of set aside. And so, for example, um, you know, I, I know in the past I, I talked to Jennifer on this. Um, for example, for yeah, capital um, in, in maintenance and facilities, um, the district had an opportunity before to set aside about, about, a million and a half. about a million and a half a year. So when you begin to set money aside like that, um, then then you get in a position where in 10 years, um, now I don't actually have to ask the community for as much because we've, we've been able to set aside money of our own with that operational cost to, to address some of those needs. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so in our particular case, in, in, our, in our capital projects, now, I'd also like to put this in context, because I don't want to 
to discredit any of the work the district has done in the past or the or the, or the decision making. But over over ten year period, and I explained to you for public school finances, the district's lost three thousand students. So three thousand times ten thousand in revenues the district's had to right size over a ten year period. And it, and that is a huge adjustment when you talk about teaching and <coughs> you know. Um, you know, you know, and, and closing schools and doing all that. It's just, it's hard to respond that quickly. So what occurred um, over those 10 years is a lot of those capital projects um, were, were used to make, keep operating costs and we didn't set aside that money because we were having a hard time balancing the budget, I'm going to assume. So, so we, this year, um, we, we, we thought one of the things we could do to begin to show the community that we're restoring those and, and going to try to offset any costs that we have to ask the community for is we're, we look at we're, we set aside money now to begin to restore those capital project budgets. So, for example, we have in, in transportation. If we begin to set money aside now over the next five years, that will build up, and then we wouldn't have to ask the community for as much money in the future, or we could begin to maintain our own bus cycle schedule. Now, the reason we're hopeful of that now, as opposed to before, is we believe our, our student population is going to stabilize. So we're, going to, we're not going to see the decline in enrollment that we've seen over the past few years. Actually, we anticipate maybe a 125 student loss, 150 student loss for the next two years, and then we stabilize. From a mindset, think about this from a business model. If, if, if every year you have a higher expenditures than revenues, you're in that, you're in that, you know, downsizing phase. Like I said before, all of a sudden, if we have revenues higher than our expenditures, we can begin to do different things with that money. And we can begin to take care of some of those deferred maintenance costs and, and those capital purchases and restore those budgets. So from so if, if we're being fiscally responsible over the next years, especially as our student population stabilizes and we see and we, we see funding that can cover our, our expenditures, our current expenditures, we can begin to rebuild those and then we wouldn't be in a position where we'd be asking the community to cover the complete cost of those. So it's basically talking about building up those Yes. Yeah. Taking from well building up fund equity basically, but yes. Does that does that add anything? Yeah, this, this was right out of operational costs. We begin to just kind of start building up those savings accounts for those future chillers and boilers and, and buses and curriculum purchases and technology purchases. Now, now, typically the districts can't cover all those expenses, so that's when now all of a sudden maybe a sinking fund would work, where it would be a 10-year and it could be at a lower rate because we wouldn't need to generate as many revenues. So we'll always be in the business, okay, for. For, for needing some help with our, 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 our infrastructure and mechanical needs because the, the state just doesn't cover that in operational cost. But in communities where you have in, increasing enrollment, um, we, we, we rely less on the community for that because we can use operational costs. So I know districts, I've had neighboring districts before that have actually built performing arts centers and, and put on field houses because they've had such increasing student enrollment over 10 years, they didn't have to ask the community for a penny because they're on that winning side of, of receiving more student foundation allowance, so they can just do that on their own. It's the districts that have declining enrollment that has just been really put in a hard spot. But that's a very good question. So yes, the hope would be that we would rely less on the community, you know, within the next 10 to 15 years, much less, and we'd be, begin to restore those budget areas, in, you know, over the next five years. Yes? So basically the previous, not you, but the previous regime Seems like I don't want to use the word mismanaged, but maybe mismanaged, well, misallocated fund. You seem to have a handle on things. I mean, I, I, but it just seems. I, I, don't, I wasn't here, right? And, and what I'm saying is, is you know, when when you have, I have never experienced right sizing. I mean, I don't know what three thousand times ten thousand actually even is. I think. Oh yeah. So. So that's the other thing. So you so you lost 
what, what is 3,000 times 10,000? <laughs> so that many millions of dollars you lost. The that were made too that played into that. The closing well, of Eagle, we lost right? all those families. Right, so then, so then on top of that though, think of this, the state also decreased right. the foundation enrollment by $600 a student, so that was a slam to you as well. So I don't, you know, could, could, can I say I could have done a better job? <laughs> I'll say that, but I don't know, I don't know that it's true. Okay. Our student, like when our kids graduated from North Farmington, it was a feeder school for the University of Michigan. Yeah, it was one of the number one. It was in the newspaper, one of the top. So if we can increase test scores, then they will come. And what you're saying is if, if more students come, then operationally we're in great shape because then what you explained about the teacher to get 100 kids or whatever it is. You are hired. I got an office for you. No, no, no. I was in front. Yes. And I learned. I mean, Help me. But that's the key. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's that's be able to compete with the Bloomfield Hills. It, it's the exactly the game, which is what we used to be. We're we're, we're, we're competing for kids. Right. Let's face it. Those standardized test scores are important to a lot of parents in our rankings. Yep. We got to get those up. Um, but we also we also have to make sure we're meeting all students' needs. So I've got a really nice game plan for how we can do that over the next five to ten years. I'd love to have that conversation. Because you're absolutely right. No, you're, you explain it. Well. Okay. Like, you know, like, Good question. No, no, but I'm going to let Jennifer explain why. <laughs> so our foundation allowance is made up of three pieces. So as I mentioned before, we can um, levy that $2,067 per pupil. So of our $10,400, $2,067 of it comes through property taxes from our residential customers. There's also 18 mills that all the businesses pay, or if you want a second home or a rental property, those 18 mills are paid to us directly. So the balance then of the foundation allowance, of which you also then pay in, it's either five or six mills, um, to the state directly, that state education tax, those go directly to the state, and then they disperse it for the foundation allowance. So because we have a larger tax base, we get a good portion of our money through property taxes. The state pays us the balance per people to get to that total um, 10,400. So it may be about, you know, it's in the 5,000s, maybe into the high fours. Um, because we're receiving a lot of our money from our taxpayers directly here. So, um, and again, the state assumes you collect your 18 mills from your taxpayers. Um, so, uh, and then they pay the balance. Hopefully that yep, helps exactly. explain. Um, so we can't say exactly how much of that comes back directly to us just because it's a formula, but that's how it works. That's right. I agree. Yes. <laughs> so going back five years, we it's a process quite data and worry about the details of the number. Thank you. We've, <laughs> we we as a community killed the bond twice. Took it from 220 to 131 or 132. We got rid of three Fisher theaters when we did that, that were going to be put into these high schools, among other things. And we had a good process when we finally got to the end. We got the community involved. I believe there were two committees. One was focusing on right sizing of the school districts, and the other one was focused on what the expenses were. So my concern with this bond is is that we don't have that citizen committee looking at the details because I know from last time and people are people, people pad the numbers, oh it would be so nice to have this, right? You know, I mean it's just human nature. I'm not putting place to blame on anybody. No, no, and, right? And again, I want to know why we don't kill this bond, wait till the next election, do it right, and we'll pad we'll pass it for you. Okay. And and that, that may be the game plan. But, what, but to answer your question, um, what, what I would say is, I, I, 
we, have, we are putting information together because we need to be more transparent in exactly what building is getting what and the cost. So, so we, we've been we've been working hard to get that information. But there's, but there's I, no I, and so I know that you, you know, Terry, Terry's knocking at my door every week and saying, "Hey, we promised this soon." Still haven't gotten. It. I'm like, I know. So we're we're gonna get we're gonna get that out to you. We just we just put some of the numbers together today, and, and it's broken out by building exactly what's going to occur. Now now on this one, here's here's what I'm saying. What? Let me, let me say it this way. Um, there's a having the having the oversight committee is is, is absolutely fine. So let me say it a different way. When I work with um, when I work with the, the police department on um, Putting these protocols in place for safety and security measures, um, I don't kind of second guess what they're telling us. When we when we bring in uh, you know a company to actually conduct a facility study for us and a comprehensive review of that, we kind of follow along what they say. Now, we're, is there areas that that there may be fluff in in this? You know, a scoreboard, a track repair. I mean, it's kind of a value-based decision. But but my my thing on it is is that those are, those things that are in the bond. Okay, are things that are going to be replaced in the next year to seven years, eight years for sure. So I can I can guarantee you there's a very high likelihood that we'll be replacing them regardless of whether this passes or not. Now, now, again, to assure you that that's going to happen, you know, you, you had the committee last time, and I'm still I'm still getting concerns of where things went. There's still not enough transparency. So that ends up being a different conversation with, with so, me and as a superintendent in the community. So Bob, let's just back up a second. So whatever happened last time, I'm talking about the process, right? Okay. And, right? The process was we finally got the numbers right by having this committee playing devil's advocate because we as taxpayers Champions. are paying, paying the money. And then, then what happened, of course, the committee said, hey, we buy into this and we said to the in the well, I wasn't on the committee, but you know, said, hey guys, this is kosher, we should do it, <coughs> right? And so, from a process point of view, I don't understand, and I, you know, you're the no, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. So, so I, why is it we didn't do this again? Why are we playing the old game, going to an election, which is a Democratic primary, low voter turnout, most chances are the best chance to pass, best chance to pass, versus both doing it right. right. So, so the doing it right part. Let's let's get back to that. I mean, again, this is a matter of earning our trust with the community that we're good stewards of the money and we're going to follow through on what we say we're going to do. So, the, the committee in particular, we have had discussions on the committee and the building site utilization committee. I think was the group, and I think there was a group of thirty that met at first. I'm looking in the back of the room, and and I and I, and I, I know I just got an email or something on my calendar that said we're going to. Re engage with that group again, or they've invited to a meeting. Diane, do, do you know when that meeting's going to occur? No, we decided a bunch of dates. Okay, so, so we're, we're, we're choosing a date to re engage with that committee. So, so again, um, I on this one, you know, I can't give you the answer that you probably hope to hear on that. Um, <laughs> but, but what I can tell you is, is if we can, if we can catch up at this point in time. You know, if there's an opportunity to catch up with that process, then let me know because because on this one, it's got there's no reason for it not to be transparent. There's no reason for it not to be transparent. There's never been a reason for it not to be transparent. Uh, I, I take far more trust in you than I certainly did in the last administration. <laughs> yeah, certainly the one before. But you know, we are it's the same. What you're saying is the same words we have heard for the last 15 years. Yeah. We're going to be transparent. We're going to take care of the money. We're going to do this. And I used to stand up in front of the board, not necessarily the people that are on it now, and accuse them of fiscal malfeasance because that's exactly what I felt like they were doing. They were not good stewards of our money. And so to come to us within four or five years of giving them this money, 15 million from Harrison wasn't spent on Harrison, where's the money? You're expanding Alameda, that wasn't part of the bond. Why? You know what? This is not doing what we as a community said, okay, we'll give you the $132 million. Do what you said you're going to do. I sat on the last site and utilization committee. None of our recommendations were taken to heart. It was a joke. Right. And, and 
And now we're, we, we've got a $132 million bond that's doing all sorts of things that it wasn't supposed to be doing. And now you tell us we need to do more. Well, you know, as a taxpayer, I'm sitting here going, okay, it's a bunch of BS. Okay, so, okay, no, no, no. Okay, so I, I appreciate that. Now, let's just give you a, another lens to look at this through just for a moment, though. Okay? Because I don't disagree with anything you said, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about communication to the community, and, and we've got a couple people in here that, that may nod their heads yes in a minute. But but the other lens to look at this through is, is you know, I get this, you know, I've only been here six or seven months now, and, but, but trust me, but trust me, I, I'm very clear on what the concerns are from, from the community and the board and, 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 the, and, the, and the school community and the staff on things. So so what one of the things I would say is, is we, we know we need to, um, be very intentional and very committed to our strategic planning process in improving our learning environments and the, and the outcomes for kids. We, we, we're going to be very intentional in that, and that's the part I'm look, looking forward to engaging with you. But, but back to the, the lens to, that I'm looking at this through is that takes time, effort, energy, and resources to do. You want, you want us over the next five years to radically improve those learning environments but then all of a sudden I'm taking operational costs out of there to fix boilers and, and chillers and heaters. Now you, now, now you see, I'm saying, okay, there's gonna be a limit to what we can do along those lines. So I, so I go back to, I, I'm, I'm certainly acknowledging and, and, and being respectful of, of the processes you've had to go through and, and your concerns. But when I go back to a community of this nature and, and the tax base here and what it actually means to a, to a homeowner with $200,000, in terms of the amount you're paying, it, it's, I'm, I'm trying to remain hopeful that, that, that somebody will give us an opportunity to, to earn back the trust along these things Once again. Again, it's the cart before the horse. This was a term that we used last time. You put the cart before the horse. Give us the money, we'll give you a plan. That, and, and you know what? I, I no, I stood up and asked for a plan for however many years. I'm not. This is but, but, this, but what I'm saying, we don't even have to talk about the plan but, right now because I think it's just, if you just think about it, if we're focused on pulling resources out of the classroom, it's going to be very difficult to enhance them. It's, it's, it's almost the simple formula. It's the I have an example that kind of probably will show people's frustration. It isn't really the conversation about the bond. This is just, you know. But it is. Well, it is. But it is. In general, my kids go to yell. And my, my youngest goes to yell. He's in fifth grade. My oldest is a freshman of farming in high school. Back when they did the remodel a couple of years ago, when they redid the front and they tried to make it secure, they redid the parking. Right. Yep. Six months after they redid the parking lot, they didn't like it. They didn't do their due diligence when they did the plan the first time, and they had to redo the parking because it's not safe or idiot parents aren't paying attention to how they're dropping their kids off or whatever. The problem is, is they spent X amount of dollars Wasted. because they didn't plan properly the first time. And now they're taking that extra money the second time, and it's still not the best. And so the frustration that you see from people, because they didn't do it right the first time, and now you're coming back and asking for more. Yeah. So no, no and, and again, you know, that and that's what I'm saying is there there's no way at this point in time I can communicate something that's automatically gonna give me your trust. I think it's gonna be a matter of seeing and believing. So you're right, maybe a later date. I don't I don't know how this will play out, but all I'm saying is 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 in terms of managing the district's finance, from my position, I would have to advise the board and the community to put us in the best financial position to maintain and enhance our quality of programming, that it's not advisable to begin to take operational costs out of, to, to pay for infrastructure costs. That's just a simple advisement from an educator. I know there's a lot of other things that this means to the community, but, but, but to me, it, it's just kind of that basic thing is, is I need, to, I need to keep as many resources in that classroom as I possibly can. And every time I pull anything out and put it towards something that's just a, uh, an infrastructure need or a bus or something that doesn't provide a direct service to the students, I'm lessening my effect on those classrooms. So I, I can't say I can't say that part anyway. They, it's not in a disagreement with anything you're saying. I'm just I'm just saying that, that that's it's the lens I'm not ours either. Okay. Yeah. So to answer your question about why it's being held in March, because if you wait, we have three elections this year. We have March, August, and November. If we wait till August, the kids will be back in school. A lot of these major. Uh, maintenance things that need to be done is when the school is closed and there's no students within the school. 
Otherwise, you're disrupting their education. So if you wait till August, then you're waiting till Christmas break. If you're waiting till November, then you're waiting for Easter break. So it's all timing, and March may not be your biggest election, but that's, that's, our, that's our fault. That's not their fault. If people don't show up for elections, it's our fault. So they need to plan that. I mean, I used to work in a school, so I know you're going to close the schools well, the day of the election. Jennifer will tell you from a finance perspective why one of the primary reasons we chose the March day. So in March, um, since there is uh, the Democratic primary, uh, we will pay very limited costs, which is printing costs, um, you know, through Oakland mm -hmm. County. If we were to hold an election, say, in May or yeah. August, I'm not sure, you know, what's well, on August. August is a August. scheduled election, so it should be the same. I'm not sure. So, um, but again, trying to pass it, um, I guess, before July 1, before the tax rate decreases, and then, it would have to increase the well, is, This is still. What are the costs associated with running a May election? Oh, $75,000. Yeah, so. We, so we, we are people that were supposed to be We don't have those. So here's, here's the issue, right? We, we agree with your point that you don't want to spend operational money in fixed boilers. We get it, right? Mm -hmm. But what we, but, but we, to the board, not to you, because other people lived through the five years ago, right? We want to know what the process is. The oversight committee for the present bond resigned, I understand. And there's still money that's to be spent. So, you know, what's pro how is an oversight committee resigning unless obviously they didn't have any power and you guys wanted to do what the hell you wanted to do, right? That's a problem too, right? So our concern is what's the governance? And what, what and how are the citizens going to be part of this governance? With governance, which means there's going to be a committee. We get it. They have there's problems with committees. But on the other hand, guess what? Last time that committee did a damn good job. And and I also don't believe that everything's going to is going to die whether we do it in this March or next March. So you know, I I, don't, I understand. The, the lady's issue, uh, it's a legitimate issue, but I don't think everything's falling apart at once. Excuse me, I'd like to say something. I've held my tongue. i worked for the school district for 30 years. I worked at Alameda. It is a high priority that I'm finally glad the district has addressed the preschool issue. We are always the last person in, last on everything. Staff training, technology, everything. Finally, they're addressing the issue. They're closing another school. They're combining and putting us in a high priority situation to build us a good center where everybody can be because you would be amazed at what that staff does and how many kids we're bringing into the district. Hmm? Why are any of us that? No. I'm finally glad all the mission. I'm finally glad we addressed the issue, though, because it was the last building to be done, and it's 50 years old, and it's falling apart. The sure. last time they had anything was shameful, and it's in such a state yeah. of disrepair. Right. It's shameful that it's got to this point. But you can't keep saying and going over and over and over and over and over everything. And just but you keep repeating everything. the same mistakes over and over again. I know, but like, let them get a try. Give them a chance. Nobody say Let them do something. I'm sorry, but I had to say something. <laughs> That's okay. Right. So, so, I, so again, you know, I, I mean, I, I hope you understand. I clearly get your point on this, and and like I said, we'll, we'll also, you know, if we can, if we can put a committee together just to make, you know, even at this late date, just to provide oversight or assure you that there's, you know, what's what we're presenting in there is actually what's contained in there, and there's a reasonable plan. Um, we're more than happy to do that, um, but but again. Um, I guess, I guess, I, you know, and I feel comfortable with that because I think you you listen to us, and I really appreciate that you you listen to, to our my perspective, and you know, I'm I'm new to the community, so uh, thank thank you. And, and we're really glad listening. that you want to do a good job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but and I, one more comment. I have a question. Oh, I had asked for some things at the board meeting, and I know you're looking into them, so I wanted to ask for a timeline and clarify 
When I sent the building report on the building site committee, we got it was literally a one page sheet that had every building with critical right, right. zero to five. It wasn't a huge right, right. program. So John is, is is working on that right now and, and actually I got some of the information that we've been requesting and we're I requested the, the additional information for this year now, so we got some of the prior information. Um, in terms of the variances from what was originally budgeted to what was spent, um, Jennifer is now working with um, the person to to make sure that you know that those are those are captured in terms of what happened. I mean, you can't go through the entire conversations of why all the adjustments were made, but I think she's got notable points in there of what led to or where the money was reallocated and for what the purpose was. So she's fine tuning that document as well, and we can get that too. So, so some of that information from the last bond will be transparent in here in terms of when monies was shipped and, and what the intention or why the decision was made to shift that money. Not that that's going to help anything, but at least you know, it, it, was, it, it answers the questions that you've had. Can we get a written guarantee from the district that they won't pull the same thing on this bond? Where would you like me to sign? No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Because this was, we were promised, this was one of our big concerns, was that the dollars were allocated, they would be spent where they were allocated, if they weren't needed, like Garrison, they would not be used. And I know that the, the Oversight Committee recommended that the last monies not be pulled because there were so many questions okay. about the use so, of the So in all fairness, those two, um, you know, I'd like, John, if you got a minute, because I know John was involved in any change orders or working through a process with the board, and we talked about that earlier, John. So, you know, when 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 we work with the finance facility committee, and you made changes, and and what Press's role is as the um, owners rep in terms of making recommendations to those. So there was processes, and, and it did go to the board. So, John, if you can kind of come up and, and explain, give an example of how you know take one area in the process that was used, because you know. So I, I don't want to just act like you know there's somebody behind the scenes that just wants. Say, well, she go over here. I don't think that that happened. Okay. Well, my concern is there were promises made that were broken. Okay. What promises would those be? I'm just curious. The promises. <laughs> Security. Security. Well, no. Okay. Well, in, terms the the dollars, in terms of the dollars, in terms of the dollars, we were we asked this Thank question you. over and over, and we we were told no, we're we're going to spend the dollars as where we're telling you we're going to spend it, and that clearly did not happen in many cases. Whether they were dollars needed in another area, Alameda, whatever, but there, but for instance, Harrison, fifteen million dollars was supposed to go to Harrison, it didn't, but but you still pulled the money, and you used it somewhere, and, and that'll be on the sheet that'll be distributed here very but, soon but to that's describe that. Point is that we were told that wouldn't happen. I, so let's, let's, start, let's, I let, let's start with security. If they know that they're going to close the school, do you still want them to spend that money? The way that, the way that you're phrasing it. You know they're going to close the school when they do it. Right, when they did that, but when they got to that point. Then you don't spend it. But can you, but like, can, you can reallocate it. Yes. But not until they're not reauthorizing the community. I mean, we can agree to disagree on that specific example. I mean, Alameda is Alameda. And it basically got funded from Harrison High School Savings and other savings within the district. In regards to security, all promises for security were completed. We did cameras at the secondary schools. We did all the fob entries at every building in the district. We did different key entries. We changed keys within the building. We did bus cameras. But it was a conscious decision by the committee, the Building Site Utilization Committee, not to do camera in the elementary schools. Now, five years later, there's a need to camera the elementary schools and supplement the secondary schools with some additional campus. Because when you put in a new system, you sort of live into it. It's not an exact sentence. So all security promises were made, including the secure entrance. What about closing the buildings? So what, what are we doing with the hill? What are we doing? This was one of the buildings that was a concern. Um, we closed the building, we opened the building. Um, I was on that, that committee that made all those recommendations, and that was all part of supposedly some of the strategic planning, however limited, that went into that final request. So we did everything we could to get off the hill, okay? And the key, the key linchpin to this whole thing is transportation. We scoured Farmington Hills for a location. <coughs> we found a location, the dealership on Grand River, 
and the property had some issues, so the district decided not to take on the liability. So we could not get off the hill. And if we did get off the hill, there would have been a bigger reallocation of bond dollars because those were, those were the only dollars available to do that work. And as far as schools closing, next, community schools closing once Alameda moves out. Central High School is in a nice new location, and then that building will be vacant. And in further closure, being a facilities director, I have a pulse on what's available within the district. There are, there are a few classrooms that may be underutilized. Some couple of them might be vacant, just miscellaneous around the district, but there's not enough space to close another building. And if we close another building, there won't be space available three years from now, and we'll be coming back to you for buying the building in addition. And, what's, and if I may ask what's happening with the um, downtown Harrington building? The city is doing its due to, it's sold. It is sold, it is. To the city farming, city farming. Okay, how much? 750. What? That money will be allocated to a fund for repairs and maintenance. Yes, Jennifer's already got the place. <laughs> so I read in one of the newspaper accounts, um, and I think you were actually quoted, I'm not positive, but I think it was you who was quoted that you were relying, or the district was relying upon what was essentially outdated data from, I think, what was the year? Was it 2000? and not going back, and those numbers were no longer reliable because they really weren't the current statistical analysis. Let me rephrase that. It was a 2009 facility study that we were using to develop a 2013 bond issue that didn't pass two years in a row. Right. Okay? So in 2015, it passes. Five years later, it's 2020, Okay, that's 10 years later, 11 years later, and in 2009, most of this infrastructure was 10 years old. And now it's 20 years old because it's 10 years later. So boilers got an expected life of about 20 years. So in this bond, we're including those boilers that weren't included in the 2015 bond. But had the study or had the, the data available, the statistical analysis available at the time, better matched, had there been a better match, we would, as a community, would have had a better idea of anticipated needs. We would have had a more comprehensive picture instead of such a piecemeal approach. I don't think a two-year delay on a facility study is uncommon. Two, but it was 2009 and you said and 2015, started, we, but then we rejected it twice and there was nothing done in the interim. Right. It, it, takes, it takes a year to develop a study. It's that sort of stuff. Yeah, the to 15 to 6 years. But in all fairness, all the same issues that identified in 2009 still existed because you had to address them. Like you're missing my point. No, but the future needs them. But the, the scale, you wouldn't be able to address them anymore. It comes down to a plan. It comes down to a plan. There's never been a plan. It's pieces. We're going to put all this together. We're going to ask you for this and we're going to do this. But now we're really going to do that. And I, I mean, frankly, from my perspective, put it on hold, give us the plan, let us know. What do you expect from us in five years from now? I mean, you're going to tell us the same things again, you're going to need more money. And so maybe the answer would have been a C. <coughs> would, would. Right now, we have a 10-year deferred capital plan right now. And that's what this bond is based on, the first seven years of that 10 years. And then that would be the purpose of trying to restore those budgets so we could, the district could make it through at least those next three years because that gives us seven years to restore those budgets if that makes sense. I think she's over here first. Sorry. Okay, no, that's all right. Are you Go sure? Yes. Yeah. I just, I kind of feel like we're going in circles and we're beating a dead horse. You guys, I, and you've been through this, you know all of this and, and you guys as well and us as well. It, we can't put blame on what happened in the past and we can't continue to 
say what if, or we should have, or things like that. I feel like things didn't go great. We did what we could at the time. We scaled down almost $100 million worth of need and did what was absolutely necessary at the time. We went from zero security in the schools to secure entries and, and the key fobs and everything that was absolutely required and the yes. bare necessity of what was required. And now we need to do it again. We need to take us to the next step. We need to make sure our kids are safe. We need to make sure that they're warm because my kid comes home every day telling me she's freezing. And they just had updates. And I know that the bare necessity was done and now we need to do more. And I feel like we just keep hitting on the same points over and over again and putting blame where it's not needed. And I know that, that things should have happened differently and I know that the intention is there to do it right this time. And I think that if we come together as a community and work together as opposed to doing the what ifs or the should haves or the you know this that, and the other thing, I think that if we come together that it'll be a lot easier to have these conversations. But I think we're just, it feels like we're just frustrating each other at this point and, and it's not necessary to put blame where it doesn't belong. Chris? Oh, I was just gonna say that the facility study also had the year before the $600 decrease in our student enrollments. When Dr. Herter was talking earlier about putting money away, there was a huge drop in income that was coming into the district that Lansing dropped on us between 2009 and 2010. So when they looked at the facility study, keep in mind that the money that they may have been projected to be able to put aside and manage some of those things was completely wiped out when we took that cut. And so that might have had an effect in the long term of them having to come back and ask for more things later. Right. Okay, so um, yes. Quick question. Um, if we believe that we have kind of plateaued now on our students coming in or leaving. Two years. Two years to get there, then yes, we'll plateau. Okay. But we're not, I mean, how much of a decrease? Uh, probably 250 students over the next two years, would you guess? And is that Just based on our trend enrollment, the cohort survival. We're graduating two of classes that have about 125, 150 kids more than our average class sizes, 10th grade to kindergarten. Okay. So for Farmington, let's say, we are we're pretty packed in there and with the ib program that's there and we're wanting to increase enrollment and add to that program as well um how was there any talk about maybe bumping out a little area to just expand a little bit in farmington or maybe do the courtyard so that some of the kids can go outside during lunch time? Well, so, so right now, um, you know, we, I, I guess in terms of the, the well, that, that goes back to longer conversations in terms of the, the formula used to determine how many students should, should be in a building or how many students the ability can serve students. Um, and, and so I, you know, I'm not, I'm not really certain where that formula came from. Um, in, in my opinion, okay, and this, this would be something I'd say, the, the committee that was addressing that, I, I talked to some of the members of that, you know, um, really the site utilization committee, in terms of how we were actually determining the numbers. And I, I've yet to see the formula used to determine the numbers of how many students should be in the building and, and how we should, and how we should, well, if it's Paul's numbers, then, then I can certainly, um, say that I completely disagree with them. And if it comes from the architect's numbers, I would say I completely disagree with them because they're, they're looking at, at educational models from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're looking at educated kids for the 2020 school year. So those collaborative and transformational spaces look much different than 800 square foot classrooms with 35 desks in them. So, so that's what I'm saying is when we, when we get into these conversations, I think it's, it's, it's the, you know, my, my idea of this is let's determine where we want to go with the teaching and learning environment and then let's develop the structure to support that. Um, when, but again, when you're in this, in this mindset, again, this, this little back side information on this way, is it 25 years in central office here, there's assistant superintendent or superintendent, so I've held this kind of discussion with communities for a long time. Um, this is the eighth district I've served in. 
And trust me, I've served in districts that have faced a lot more challenges than, than this community. And, and, and what I say is, you know, there's, as I came into the community and took a look at the efforts of the bond, I know there's areas that, that cause some, some concerns for folks. But I, know, I don't know, if you, if you walk through Warner, if you take a look at the re renovations that actually did take place, if I was at Almino the other night, if, if you take a look at the space that they're creating and what they'll be able to do to educate those kids, from an educator's per per perception, wow. Okay, now we've got something to work with. I've got the space to work with to do some very innovative things with children. So that, to me, that's a gift. And I know there's areas of concern, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disregard those or downplay them at all. Um, because I think that's the relationship the district needs to have with the community so there's that trust and transparency. But, but based on, on the high school piece, um, it, it's, it's, it's very tight, okay? But, but next year, there'll be 100, 100 plus less kids there. So oh, at that one high school? Yeah, at yeah. Farmington High. So it, automatically, you're gonna see relief, and we're actually moving certain programming out of there to um, Farmington Central, so that'll, <coughs> that'll increase the amount of classrooms available. So you're, so you're gonna see a noticeable difference just next year. So, of course, one of the interesting things we, we face right now is, is now kind of reestablishing those feeder paths um, from, from, the, from the middle schools now because um, uh, that wasn't considered for, for the next year. So that's why the board's discussing uh, intra-school choice options and what these feeder paths are now because we have to make sure we're balancing those out so that the way we develop those district lines is going to be something we have to work with parents in the community on as well. Um, so we're not oversizing a building and undersizing another building and utilizing it. So, um, but, but I would say that there will be a relief in Farmington High in next year. <coughs> and honestly, I think that, you know, the kids have adapted very well. Um, and, you know, we've we struggled with space. And again, that's what I'm saying is the, the most frequent complaint I get or concern from Farmington High is space and not having space to educate the kids the way we would hope to. And so, and so you know, that's what I'm saying is some of these other um, schools, you have space now. Can we use the space more effectively? Absolutely. But uh, space is kind of a premium in schools if you're looking at some of these transformational areas. Just to give you an example, when I was in South Haven, we, we had a, a high school, we had the community was gonna support a renovation in our high school. Um, when, we, when we got into the project, we wouldn't have known this from the conceptual drawings of the architects, but when, but when the construction company got in and then all of our science classrooms were inside next to a courtyard. And so they were gonna actually have to hand carry all the, all the you know, infrastructure in to redo the water, to redo the gas, to redo all the electrical. And I think our labor costs were gonna be over $2 million just to hand cart that through the building into the courtyard and, and begin to work on a science lab. So after the bond was already passed, Right? And after all these conceptual drawings, you know, the construction management company reveals that, and they said, hey, if you just bump out these classrooms and turn them into science classrooms, we can save you $2 million. And that $2 million then could go to enclose that courtyard and create a 15,000 square foot integrated learning center. That 15,000 square foot integrated learning center happens to be the most unique transformational space on the west side of the state right now. So, so like, like John said, as you go through this bond, it's, it's, it's making the decisions, but it's, but it's actually communicating to making sure the community's up to date and those, and those groups are in the process. But, I, but I, can't, I can't, honestly, I can't say that, I, just, I can agree with you that the money um, that was used before was repurposed in a way that, that you weren't aware of or hadn't approved of in the first place, but I can't say that it wasn't used, you know, wisely. Um, that, that's the part I struggle with. I, I'm really going out there and trying to be critical of saying, was Almeida a poor decision? No, I mean, not from an educator standpoint. Was it, was that, was it a, a different decision? And what, was the community involved in that? And, and was it explained? And was there processes for it? it apparently not, okay? But, but again, in, in the big picture here, um, I, don't, I just want everybody, you know, that, that at least part of this conversation in closure, you know, we, we've, got, we've got good infrastructure, we've got good schools, we've got good staff. And, and you know we, we can certainly move forward. The, the way we move forward will be term, determined in March. But I just want everybody to notice too, this is kind of the message I left you with on that day, is, is you know, we're, we're gonna focus on teaching and learning regardless. And that's gonna be our priority, and we're gonna move that, that group forward. So whether, we, whether we, we're supported from the community that enhances our efforts that way, or where we have to do it on our own for a while, we'll get it done either way, okay? So, you know, if you have more questions, if you could just, you know, write them out, we'll make sure we give you a thoughtful response to them. 
and, um, and, and leave them with Diane or leave them on the table, Diane will talk to them. And um, I really appreciate your time tonight. We do have a couple of these, you know, still scheduled. If you'd like to return or, or if you have other questions. If this particular group, if you have questions, feel free to just email Diane or myself and we'll get back to you as well. Or if you'd like a range of time to meet, I'd be happy to meet with you, or, or, you know, over the next few weeks. Thank you for your time tonight. We really appreciate the conversation.